You know that we have a church culture, right? You look to the person to the left of you and the person to the right of you, and we have a church culture. Well, you don't have a person to the left of you. You have to think about that. Right? You don't have a person to the left of you, whatever. The one behind you, the one in front of you. The people around you actually form a church culture. Generation after generation of pre methodists form a church culture and have different types of practice. Right? I want to talk about cultural relativism, but I want to talk about church culture as well, but also what's outside of church culture. So the message today is cultural relativism. You're probably wondering at this point, why, what do I have in my hand and why am I carrying it around? And you're going to say, uh-oh, he's going to do something weird. You should expect that of me because I'm kind of a weird guy. But I brought this up here because I wanted to talk about cultural relevance in the church and then move outside of the church. A few months ago, a couple months ago, somebody came to me and asked me, somebody very near and dear in leadership, uh, came to me and asked me, Sharon, <coughs> uh, Sharon came to me and asked, right? She asked me, how come we don't do altar calls? She said, I've been in Free Methodist churches and she's just curious as to why we don't do altar calls. There are some Free Methodist churches that do altar calls. Altar calls are part of church culture. Did you know that? They're part of church culture. This is something that would scare some people if you're very uh, uh, traditional, liturgical in the sense if you don't like uh, freedom kinds of things. No, no disrespect. Okay, that's not the intent. The purpose is this is from a culture. What do you think this is? It's not curtains from... Jonathan's room. All right. <laughs> right? This is called a fire shawl. How many of you have ever been to a charismatic church or a Pentecostal church before? We've got at least six, okay? The others are afraid. It's okay. Jonathan, come here for a minute. I just wanted to show you. We're not going to use it. I just want you to show you something that's culturally different. Okay, grab me in. Okay, instead of an altar call, in some churches they have kind of a thing that they call a fire tunnel or a prayer tunnel. This is just one way. And we kind of wave this thing, and you run underneath this, and the Holy Spirit touches you. This is just part of their culture. Does that scare you? Okay, good. I'm glad you said that. Some people get scared when we do stuff like that. That's church culture. Is it important to understand the culture that you're in? Yes. Why? So that you could speak to the person in the culture? Yes? No? There's headlights. Deer in the headlight. I got a deer in the headlight look. So that you can speak to the person in that culture. That's what we're going to talk about. So I talked a little bit about church culture. Let's move on to this term that I'm calling cultural relativism. Cultural relativism, if you didn't get it already, it's actually self-explanatory, is the idea, and here's the, the uh, funk and wagon, the, the dictionary uh, version of it, is cultural relative, relativism is the idea that a person's beliefs, activities, should be understood based on that person's own culture, language, art, forms of communications. Now, if you watched, I'm doing these little things called Creator Heart Moment. I did this one in a short synopsis already. The reason I thought it was relevant to preach on cultural relativism is change happens. Do you know change happens? Okay, we got some good, there's a few head nods, that's good. Change does happen. And today, if you don't know this, change is moving very rapidly. We live in this age we call the age of communication. We can go out to social media. We can go on the Internet. And we can see that not only does communication move so rapidly, we can't even keep up with it. It's daunting. But also technology is moving rapidly. And this technology and the communication is moving so fast that it causes the culture even to shift in little ways and large ways. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. And so what does that do? Not only does it make my head turn completely around like an owl or someone who's other-spirited, it makes my head turn around because it's difficult to keep up with. 
That's why we want to start with Isaiah. Isaiah 43, 18, which we read. Let's look at that again. It says in Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, it says, Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will, will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Will you be aware of it? Just think about if you got this new pastor, somebody like me or somebody like someone else, that comes in and starts to mess with your culture. Do you like it? Only a little. Only a little. Good answer. Because the truth is, you'll either like it only a little, or you'll be indifferent, or you'll really, you really won't like it at all. Why? Because it comes to the place of comfort. Our cultures are formed and make us comfortable. Okay? So in Isaiah, what is it talking about here? It's talking about God is actually trying to direct us into the ability to receive and move forward and not be stuck in the past. We can look around us and we can see people with blue hair, orange hair, piercings, tattoos. We can see people that do weird things in the way they dress or whatever. We can call it weird or we can say, hey, we just want to love them in the name of Jesus. You see, it's important to understand and look around us that we don't have people like that so much. Jonathan, maybe a little bit, but his hair is blonde. Um, we don't have that many of those people among us. Should we? Yeah. So cultural relevance in the languages that we speak are very, very important. So we look at Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. Let's look at Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23 says, The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, never fails. They are new every afternoon. I'm glad you were reading that. Every morning, great is your faithfulness, God's faithfulness. Psalm 33, verse 3. Psalm 33, verse 3 says, sing to him a new song. Sing to him an old song? Huh? A new song. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. Psalm 40, verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Psalm 96, 1. Sing to the Lord an old song. A new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Psalm 98, 1. A song. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. Psalm 144, 9. You know, there's a lot of singing going on in these things. Psalm 144, verse 9. I will sing a new song to you, O God, upon a harp of ten strings. I will sing praises to you. Psalm 149, 1. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Isaiah 42, 10. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, your islands and those who dwell in them. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In Psalm 14, 3. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Now, 
If we can get to a picture, do we have it? Awesome. Ooh, pretty. pretty. Yeah, it's pretty. <laughs> what is that? Anybody know what that is? You ever been to Athens? You ever been to Greece? There's a place called Mars Hill. It's also called the Areopagus. And up on top of this place, not the temple part, you can kind of see the little white thing sticking up that's the existent temple, but there's a rock, which is a high place, and it's called the Areopagus, and the whole hill is called Mars Hill. There was this guy, ever heard of him? His name was Paul. Ever heard of that guy? His name was Saul, but he was trying to do the modern thing and he changed his name to Paul. No, that's not how it happened. I want to talk about this hill. I want to talk about, and I want you to grab a hold of three points, at least these three points, if not more, in relevant to cultural relevance or relativism. You see, even in Paul's time, Paul was going into lands where he wasn't of the same mind or culture, was he? He was different. So there's three things I think that this passage is once we get to it in Acts 17. And you can open up your Bibles to Acts 17 because we're going to talk about the Areopagus. The Areopagus is a high place. The Areopagus is a temple. The Areopagus is a place where not only did they do Greek theater, but they exchanged new ideas in this culture. They spoke about new things that were coming. But the Areopagus in that culture, in the Athenians, in the Areopagus site, the people that practiced there, they talked about new things and they had theater, but this was also a center for law and justice. Anytime there was a, a murder or a capital crime, they used this as a judgment seat, the Areopagus. In the Areopagus, there were in the whole city and the whole surrounding area around Athens were gods and many gods. And so Paul is entering into this place as he's been released or brought in and waiting for a couple of other disciples. He's waiting there and he sees all of these other gods in this foreign culture to him. He sees these gods and he's rather miffed or disturbed or he really doesn't like it so much, right? And so he sees this going on in this culture. <coughs> And he notices in this high place, this Areopagus, this theater, this judgment seat, this place where they are actually speaking about new ideas, a placard or a notification uh, carved in stone, something that says something like this, the unknown God. So he went into this culture and he begins to assess the culture around him. He begins to assess the norms of what's going on with the people around him. And he begins to listen to how God speaks to his heart and come up with a plan in his own heart. Because that was what you would do if you're going to a strange place and you're being a person trying to bring the light into that strange place. And so there's three things that Paul does here in this passage before we get to this passage. The Apostle Paul had been reasoning with the people in Athens about God, about Jesus, and the resurrection. He hadn't gone to the Areopagus yet. He's in the marketplace. And he's in not only with the Jews in the area, but the non-believers. He's with different people groups in this city. And he begins to talk about God and the resurrection, Jesus. And another thing that he does is he earned the right because he was speaking of new ideas and new things, and this is kind of what the culture liked to do. He was speaking in the forum where new ideas were discussed, namely the Areopagus, with great compassion, with great precision, and with cultural relevance. He preached to them a message of repentance in a way that they began to understand. 
I think that's important. The other thing is, it was effective. It worked. So let's look at this. What was Apostle Paul doing in Acts 17, 16 through 21? The unknown God. Acts 17, 16 through 21. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? I think some of us pastors are perceived as idle babblers at times. <laughs> Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling and hearing some new ideas. Did you know you can go around the city of Everett, the town of Everett, you can go around the city, Reed City, you can go around Big Rapids, and you can go into... Ferris, and you can go into these places where young people are meeting in the, in the restaurants and the coffee shops, and you know what they're talking about. They're talking about something that might even be foreign to us, but they're probably talking also about some new things, things in their own culture, things that are relevant to them. And so it's important as we see Paul, he's, he's, be, he's listening, he's in the marketplace, he's you know, we could say that he's at Starbucks having a coffee with someone he doesn't even know, a stranger. Or maybe he's at McDonald's and somebody brought, bought him a Big Mac or some chicken McNuggets. He's in the marketplace. He's amongst the people and he begins to hear the way they communicate. He begins to hear things probably like, we've got this God over here, we've got this God over here, we've got this one up here, and then there's that one up there. Oh, it could be Aries or Mars. We're not really sure because we lost track of who that God really was. But that's the high place. That's where we do all of the big business and the big you know, discussions up at the Areopagus. And we discuss things down here, but at some point we're going to go up there because we kind of like what you're talking about. See, it's that liking what we're talking about that really makes the key or the importance, the important part of communicating in the world. Liking what we're talking about, connecting in some way, having a form of communication that begins to prick the heart that opens up our eyes and our ears and we begin to wonder about something. It could be something like this. I'm sitting down in a restaurant or somebody sitting there with pink hair and a, a thingy on their tongue that kind of caught like this and they look like a fifty more, Right? It could be that they got tattoos covering their whole body. It may not even be that. Maybe they got a blue tie and a white shirt and a suit on, and they come from a corporate world, and I don't know what their corporate world or their culture is like, and I begin to talk to them and befriend them and understand the way that they communicate. It may not even be that. I might be going overseas, and there's a foreign language, and I sit down in a coffee shop or a piece of pie or something, and I begin to try to communicate and watch people, and I begin to decipher the way that they think and the way that they process and I'm really intrigued, I'm interested in those people because our call is to be interested in people. Did you know that our call, I'll touch this carefully, because some are called, this is the exception to the rule, but some are called to be monastic, but that's a little hard, you know what I mean? Monastic means to be isolated, right? In the sense of Christendom is to be isolated only to God. Did you know there are very few people that are actually called in that manner? Most of us, as Christ was called, were called to be in the marketplaces, to be in the highway, in the byway, in the places where people meet to actually be Jesus and be light and salt around to everybody around us. And this is the apostolic call of Paul as he's in this city. 
And so they may not have had pink hair, and they may not have had a piercing through their tongue. They may not have had a white shirt and a suit and a red tie. They may not have had those things, but they were different than he was. And it goes on in Acts 17, 22 through 29. Acts 17, 22 through 29, it says, So Paul stood in the midst of, they invited him up to the Areopagus. He made it up there for criticism and to be critiqued as well as new ideas. You see, culturally what was happening is anybody that would incite a, re a rebellion against what was going on in the government, they would actually be judged for that. So it, I believe that part of this is we study what happened at Mars Hill, as we study what happened at the Areopagus, is it's twofold. They wanted to hear the good ideas, but there was also potentially a judgment that could go on because he's going to the high place. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. That they would seek God. If perhaps they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. So Paul on the mountaintop, the highest place in the city, in the Areopagus, declares that the unknown God is in fact the God of gods. And there were some that believed because not only was he filled with the Holy Spirit, but he partnered with the Holy Spirit became culturally relevant. And how do we know this? Well, the first thing is, is he noticed that there was this inscription about the unknown God. And what I really appreciated, how many of you like a backhanded comment? <laughs> this was actually a backhanded compliment. What am I saying? Well, he says this. He says to them who are religious people, he says, I perceive you are very religious, for I have for I even found a tribute to the unknown God. It is this God that I'm telling you about. That is utter genius. That is genius. Why? Because he's taking their terms. He's taking their culture. He's taking their understanding. He's taking their blue and pink hair and their pierced tongue and he's telling them the story of their own life. You see, that's how God begins to use and touch and affect others through us is when we can actually tell the story of the person's life that we're talking to. Paul, anointed by God, recognized this. He recognized the importance of cultural differences. He recognized the importance of cultural relativism. He recognized the importance of speaking a language that those around him could understand. Now some of you might say, well pastor, 
I'm not going to go to McDonald's and sit down with that person with pink hair and a piercing through the tongue. Maybe you won't. I don't know. But when we talk to whomever we talk to, no matter what they look like, no matter what they do, it's important to listen so that we can understand their story. So that we can understand the way that they move, they breathe, the way that they exist, the things that they like, the things that they dislike. Why? Because at some moment, the, the Holy Spirit will call upon us and ask us to be culturally relevant to them. And if we can't speak to them, guess what happens? We miss an opportunity, number one. We miss an opportunity that God has given us to speak Jesus into somebody's life. That's number one. We miss the opportunity not only to speak Jesus into somebody's life, but to be blessed by God. And you know the most powerful thing that can happen to us, the thing that can stir us the most, the thing that can bring joy and more power and more authority in us, to us for God's kingdom, for his purposes, is when we're faithful to speak to those as God has called us to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you, God didn't call me to be monastic. In other words, God didn't call me to sit in a closet. God didn't call me to, to just stay out here at the parsonage or just stand here in the church and preach at you. Good, good, yeah. Thank God. Right? God called me to talk to people. God called me to listen to people. God called me to understand where those people are coming from. So Why? that God can talk to them. You see, you are the light of the world. And what happens when you hide that under a bushel? You are salt. You are light. You are full of his purpose, his presence, and his power. And the only way God has chosen primarily, I can't speak for God, this is Dan, as Paul said, now I, not God, right? But I can say this as he speaks to me and through me, that we are called to be his mouthpiece. It's kind of dangerous. It's kind of scary. Some might even say that's a little blasphemous, but it's true. God chose us to speak his truth to man. And it's our responsibility to understand the people and the culture around us so that then we can have the conversation, that we can understand them, that we can become relevant to them. There are people that could come in and not understand why we do the things that we do. They could even look at the furniture and wonder why we don't have chairs. Don't worry, I don't care either way. Chairs or pews, we're all cool. You could come in here and wonder why we have drums and we don't have an organ. And why we have an organ and we have drums. They could come in here and look around and it could be culturally different to them. And in fact, in this day and age, it's hard to get people outside of Jesus to come into these places. Because they don't understand our culture. You see, it's when we understand them and they understand us, then God begins to move. And if we don't have that connection between the community around us, we'll never change anything. God won't flow through us the way that he desires to. We have to be people of cultural relevance so that we can be salt and light to the world, so that we can speak Jesus into other people, no matter what they look like, no matter where they come from, no matter how disdained we may feel about them. It could be a murderer. It could be someone even worse. It could be if there is a worse thing, it could be someone we think is really bad. God is calling us to speak to people. Amen? Amen. You want to do something different? Uh, you, well, he's going to do it again. Okay? We're going to move to communion. But at the end of communion, I'm actually going to have an altar call. Okay? And in this altar call, there are three things I want to ask you. Okay? If you don't really know Jesus... No matter how old you are, don't be ashamed. If you don't really know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to step forward and actually kneel here at the altar and we'll pray for you. That's number one. Number two, if you want to go deeper with Jesus or you feel like you don't have the relationship that you think you should have or desire to have, I want you to come forward and we're going to pray for you. 
And number three, kind of like the second one, but maybe a little deeper, is you've lived with Jesus most of your life, but you just want to have more fire in your belly. You just want to have more presence. You just want to have more of Jesus inside of you so that then we can speak to people outside of our place. So think about those things. If we can have a couple of three, four gentlemen come forward, and we're going to serve you communion. Richard, uh, Roger, who else? Joe, is that three? One more? Anybody? All right. Richard, you're going to Oh, Jeff, okay. I think we got four. One more? Bob? You know, it's like, come on, Pastor, pick somebody. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So we're going to take communion. We're going to bring it to you. And you're going to pray, and you're going to do the thing that we do in the Bible. We're going to examine ourselves. We all do this in light of God and who we are, where we are right now. No matter where you are right now, it's still important to do this. It's important that we examine our, ourselves as we recognize the blood and the body of Christ. So let's pray. Father God, you're holy, you're mighty, you're worthy. You are the God and creator of all things. You are an all-consuming fire, and yet you are Abba, Daddy. You are Jesus, the Son. You're the one that sheds your blood. And as we take these elements, the body and the blood, the blood and the body as represented here in the bread and the juice, Lord, that you <coughs> shed your blood that you gave your body for, for us, that we could have everlasting life. And you sent your Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you come through this communion. We know you're here with us, but more fire, Lord, more of your purpose, more of your presence, more of your power, God, fill us beyond overflowing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
So Jesus took the bread as he was gathered together with those, his disciples, and he raised it up and he said, this is my body. I can't even imagine that. The word actually tells us that every time we come together that we should recognize the bread, the blood, and the, the body and the blood of Christ. So Jesus said, here it is. This is me. Take and eat. Take and eat. And then he took the cup and he talked about blood, his blood. Of course, they understood some of that because he already taught them about the lamb's blood and he taught them about he being the lamb, but they didn't still quite comprehend it. You know, we now comprehend it. The blood of Jesus taken from Thank you, Jesus. Now, if Bonnie... Did you play something? I'm going to ask her to play something. We're going to do something a little different for this altar call. I know we're running late and blessed that no one's stomach's ground. Not even mine. I said I wanted to do an altar call. This altar call will actually be in lieu of the doxology. Okay? So if you didn't feel like you needed to pray with or for somebody, hopefully you do feel like you want to pray for somebody. But I'm going to ask those of you, if you do not feel like you really know Jesus, and it's okay if no one comes up, that's awesome. But if you feel like you really don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to come forward and come here to the altar. And then the second thing is, maybe you know Jesus and you just don't feel like you're right with him right now. Maybe you don't feel like you're fulfilling the purposes that God has for you in your life. That's the second one. And then the third one is, how many of you want more fire? Okay, what that would normally mean is everybody would come run into the altar. And those of you that want more fire, I'm asking you to come up here and we're going to pray. I'll even have my eyes closed so the first one doesn't have to feel uncomfortable. If you want the fire of God to pour out on you, you just want more of Him, more of His presence, more of His purpose, more of His power, more of what He's doing and less of me. Less of you, less of me, not just me. <laughs> less of the flesh. God, we just ask you, Father God, to come and fill this place. More of your purpose, more of your presence, more of your power. So, Father God, we just pray for every soul in here today, not only those that are making this personal confession for whatever reason going on in their heart, just more of your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask for you to rebaptize us, to baptize us again. Lord, fill us in ways that we are unfamiliar with, that we don't even know, God. And maybe even there's a degree of apprehension or fear, God. We ask that you remove those apprehensions and the fear of your presence, of your power within us, Lord. Father, we desire more of your fire that we would be light and salt. It would be so full of you, Jesus, that when someone looks into our face, they see you. When they look into our eyes, they see the eyes of Christ. When they hear the words we speak, they hear the mind of Christ, Lord. Father, we ask for more of your humility, more of your brokenness within us, that we would truly be the vessels of honor that you desire. For us to live is Christ, but to die is gain. We just declare that over ourselves, Lord. We ask for the fire of your Holy Spirit to fall down upon us now in this place, to fill us beyond overflowing, Lord. Not for some selfish thing, but for you, King Jesus. 
or you, King Jesus, that we would fulfill the mission, the, the story that you wrote about us, the gifts that you've given. Every single one of us in here has gifts, Lord. And Father, I acknowledge that before men and you, Lord, that every person here is filled with gifts that you've given them for your purpose, Lord. We ask, Lord, that those gifts would be recognized and break open the understanding, Lord. And break open the boldness, Lord. And break open the love and the desire to be salt and light in this community, God. More, Lord. More of that. More of what you desire to do, Lord. Fill us. Fill us, Lord, beyond overflowing. Each and every one of us, Lord. And as you're gathered together, I want you to just touch the person on the hand or shoulder. Hold their hand. And I'm just going to touch, you either touch them on the shoulder or the back of the head or the back. Make it correct. <laughs> so Father God, as we anoint one another, as we pass your spirit through, as we touch our dear friends and family, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to flow through us like a river. Like a torrent, God, may your spirit move through us, Lord that we would be flowing with your purposes, that we would be flowing with your presence, that we would be filled with love and hope and healing. Bless this time. Bless these people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can hug. It's okay to hug. If you need to go, you're blessed. Be blessed. Shalom. Peace. That's why I couldn't do that.